Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for your word and the clarity of it. would ask that you would give us wisdom as we look into it. Thank you for all these who participate in the ministry, volunteering and giving faithfully. Thank you. Bless each one. And heavy on our hearts remains the wonderful people of the Ukraine and so many in Russia who don't want this either. The tension, the devastation. I'd ask that your Holy Spirit would be active in people's lives. Bring many people to yourself. As we look now into your word, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. It's Romans 10. And as you recall, we're not going to find balance between God choosing and you having free will. What we're actually doing is finding contradiction. This is like a dream come true for me that I can teach and actually intend to contradict. So this is, um, this is not going to be difficult for me. If you recall, we're in the chapters of 9, 10, and 11. And if you remembered that house that we worked through, it's the uh, lobby, and then you made a left into that really dark room, and then back into the sunroom. Next to the sunroom, a bit of an exercise room. And now we're sitting at the kitchen table. And we're talking about chapters 9, 10, and 11, God's sovereignty. In chapter 9 was crystal clear. Chapter 9 is telling us that we are chosen. And just in case you didn't understand that or you thought you would explain it away with predestination that maybe he saw what you were going to do so he chose you as a response to that, just in case you didn't get it, he gave an example that the potter is actually creating some for honorable purpose, and he is creating others for dishonorable. Now give me the predestination story. It, it doesn't work. As I think the phrase, and at least in my mind over and over, is chosen is chosen. Let that rest. That was last week. If God chooses, then man doesn't choose. If man chooses, then God isn't choosing. And the answer, of course, is yes. There's the contradiction. Back to back, chapter 9, then chapter 10. And once again, that is too often in the scriptures, we're focusing on the theology that we do not understand, and missing the point of the text. And it builds, the chapter builds and builds to some of the most beautiful verses about whoever wills, let him come, believe in him for everlasting life. It is the driving point of the text is that you and I have access to God through faith in Jesus Christ. And you, the masses, may believe or not believe. But instead, we focus on the divisive theology of it. There was a great writer in the 1800s that said, when you read the scriptures, do not let the things that you do not understand bother you. Let the things that you do understand bother you. And the clarity in this text, the tail end, is so fantastic and crystal clear, and yet so many of us with an objective mind wants to go back and reconcile the apparent contradiction of two passages and two ideas when we should take a step back and let them both breathe. Let them be alone. Let them settle in a way that absolutely could be contradictory in my mind, but not God's. So if you look at the passage here, we are in Romans 10. The first point in your notes is that there is human responsibility in salvation. 
There is human responsibility in salvation. And the chosen, those that believe in chosen, although I do, those that push that too far don't even like that sentence. Human responsibility. It's explained, it's explained away. Oh, you had responsibility because you chose way early on to be separated from God and you're dead in your sin and now you do not have the ability to choose because you pre-lost it. No, that's not what we're saying. We're saying to the masses, whoever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. It's your responsibility. It's my responsibility. We live in a no-fault culture. You literally have a no-fault divorce. You have no-fault insurance. These are actual excerpts from an insurance company where individuals who had accidents explained what went wrong. The telephone pole approached my car at a rapid speed. As I swerved to get out of its way, it hit me. The other car collided with mine without giving warning of his intention. I started to slow down, but the traffic was more stationary than I thought. (laughs) See, this is all I'm not guilty. It's I'm not at fault. I made a mistake. This last one, my better judgment would be do not read it which means it's my favorite, and you bet I'm going to read it. I pulled away from the side of the road. I glanced at my mother-in-law, and I drove over the embankment. (laughs) Honestly, you should be ashamed of yourself for laughing at that. I just set you up, and you all sinned right in front of me. By your choice but God let you sin. I am testing you. I'm testing you and you failed. (laughs) Failed miserably. It's a natural part of our makeup to to explain away. I, I blew it. I made mistakes, weakness. We have responsibility. So the following chapter is, this chapter is clear. We see passages as you look in chapter 10. Verse 1, brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them, Israel, is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. He is flat laying the weight of on them. You chose to not respond to the righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Skip on a little bit more, for instance, verse 6, but the righteousness based on faith says, do not stay in your heart. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Those first couple of verses, I think, are trying to show, you're going to say, you go up to heaven and bring Christ down or go into the abyss. There's this confusion of idea that is followed by such clarity. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. I circled through this text, the you's and yours. You confess your mouth, your heart, you will be saved. Verse 11, for the scriptures say, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. 
Verse 13, for everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. If somebody is without Jesus, it is not because they are non-elect. It's because they rejected Jesus. That's R. Kent Hughes. Look at that second point. It's a divine paradox. You paint both sides of the coin, and, and we're not bringing balance. We're stating both sides at the same time and allowing there to be a divine paradox. Ephesians 1 is so many other passages. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. But then we have other passages in the scripture. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count promise, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Is he playing a game with us? When he says, whosoever, my heart is that all of you would respond. Anyone who professes Christ will be saved. Is this a game? Or is he offering something that is actually available to you? And there's this tension that we want to, and this is how it is. This, as much as I wish it were not this way, there is a created theology and we're fitting pieces into it. We have to explain and bend one way or another to fit into the theology. But this side of free will does the exact same thing. You have a concept that you want to make known and so you take passages to bend into it. When our goal is to speak of the scriptures as they lay in front of us, I don't want to be the one that promotes a theology. I told a friend of mine in Tucson, great Presbyterian guy who strong in evangelism. And I told him, I said, you know, I went through your lobby. And just so you know, and we're kind of laughing already, I said, half of the tracks and information in your lobby is promoting Calvinism, your five points as represented in the letters of Tulip. I said, do you know that? I would walk in and look at your lobby, and I would assume that that's the name of your church, is Tulip. When that becomes out front, back it off, back off. This text, for instance, as chapter 9 speaks of that beautiful theology that we are chosen as much as the potter creates some for honor and some for dishonor, that kind of chosen. But then it starts to blossom in chapter 10 that says, you can choose, it's up to you. And if we don't allow the text to build to that which is most important, we are not reading the text correctly. I even see explanations of one side or the other based on their perceived points. And I'm like, you are creating a system and then your non-biased explanation is using your outline to do it. I think because it's too hard to find all the passages and refute some away because it doesn't fit. I hear arguments, by the way, explaining both sides. Let me give you a little word of advice, and this fits in any field of study at all. You and I can create an illustration to prove anything. That is very important. 
I don't care what the idea is. It could be so wrong. Give me five minutes, and I will come up with an illustration that proves your point. That's wrong. It's like anecdotal. It's if I give something, and you go, well, it must be true. The, the examples that we could give would be examples that the scriptures give. And he didn't use one, he used two in chapter 9. The clay, crystal clear, and then the one in everybody's mind, Pharaoh. You mean to tell me that you actually created him and then hardened his heart? And the answer is yes, he did. And then he turns around and offers to everybody, anyone who comes can come. When we look at particular theologies in the Bible, I can, I can really prove to you through ample passages and focus on them that Jesus is man. I mean, you can't argue it. I mean, he is, he cried. He was tired. He was hungry and thirsty. He fought for rest, saw the need for rest. But then I can show the other side. I can show independently, not for balance, but independently I could show that he is God. Well, so much so that he was killed because he claimed to be God. Which is it? And it's the same issue as we discussed last week with the Trinity, and I believe it's the same issue that we have here. as we look into these next steps of where are we in this? Where does this go? How do we we respond? I don't want to be too far out on either side. This is true when you have good, God-fearing people at one side and you have God-fearing people at the other side. If that's true, fill in the doctrine, fill in the belief, but if you have wonderful believers in Christ at either side, that tells me I need to take two, three steps back. It also tells me that it's probably not able to be understood. You take certain doctrine that all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. You go ahead and put all believers on one side of that. All means all, and that's all all means. You don't have believers on the other side going, well, not exactly all. Because I'm pretty close to not sinning. You don't have that, so you look and go, okay, this God has made crystal clear. But then you cover some of the other subjects, and we divide and we have believers on both sides. Then we have believers so far on each side that they villainize. And you've probably heard it too. And I sit down back and say, how is this possible? How is a believer actually going so far as to say, I don't even know if the believers on the other side are actually really believers because they're not responding correctly. Then this side does it to the other side. Back away. So you have chapters 9, 10, 11, 9, chosen, chosen, and chapter 10, it's whosoever, and then chapter 11 is dealing just with Israel. That's this section. 
And as you and I allow the passage, chapter 10, to work its way, it builds and builds to the fireworks of you choose, you choose, you choose, whoever, whoever. For God so loved the world that whoever believes in him, yes, whoever is chosen in him, yeah, I think so. I think you're right. Because he created some one way and created others another way. But I think it's all also right that you have the freedom to choose. So our next steps here, what do we do? We make a decision on salvation and we make every effort to tell other people. You want to talk about a similarity, not the extremes maybe. The, the extremes are the the, the nutcases, and every view has the nutcases. I'm not even, right? It's like America today with politics. They're, the nutcases, like, are in charge of the asylum, right? It's like America, in God we trust. No, America, one flew over the cuckoo's nest. That's what it should be, starring Jack Nicholson. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to leave the sides alone. And I'm going to find this area in the middle, the folks that I love, my friend in Tucson, who is a dear bull at this area right here. The one in Tucson, when way back when Grant was born, he said, um, he goes, hey, why don't you bring that boy down here and we'll baptize him for you. And I went, that is so nice right after you show me in the Bible where it says to do that. He laughed, rolled his eyes. I laughed, rolled my... I don't care. That is, that is not a problem for me. We can enjoy the dialogue. The reason is we enjoy the dialogue and then we find above it my, the importance of me choosing Christ and the importance of me telling others about Christ, that I'll die for. Him as well. He's so five point. I, I think in front of his house, I think there is like a whole flower bed of tulips. That's how proud of it it is. So... Jen, I told your kids joke. The kids actually were over at the house. Well, who's the, how old's the oldest? Twelve. How old's the youngest? Seven to twelve. So they said, uh, hey, pastor, tell us a joke. And I said, no, oh, I just so happen to have one. And they're all excited. And I said, kids, you understand that in Calvinism, their flower is the tulip. Okay, at this point, their eyes are huge. Huh? I said, hang on, it gets funny. In Calvinism, there's five points and it spells tulip. And they're like, okay. One's looking over going, you asked. You should not have asked for a joke from the pastor. And I said, do you know, do you know the flower for the Arminian? And they're like, I, I don't even know what that means. I said, it's the, uh, I said, it's the daisy. He loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. And I'm like, ha, ha, ha. And they're like, ha. They're not going to ask me for a joke again. I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. Remember Falwell's remark? Falwell's remark, as I shared last week, is, I don't know about this election chosen free will thing. I only know is the more people I tell about Christ, the more elect there are. To a theologian, they go, oh, he didn't just say that. That is so incons inconsistent with your definition and your theology. That's what it's in contradiction to. That sloppy statement fits so well with 9 and 10. And you understand that there was no 9 and 10. There were no verses. It's a letter. So he moves from one right into the next. There is not even a paragraph distinction. 
it just flows from one to the other and we let it breathe and we let it rest. So last week, uh, I, was, I was in the lobby and it was actually an older person that I was talking to this time for another tulip joke. Oh, I've got tons of them. So it was D. James Kennedy early in his, his ministry. And as you know, he founded Evangelism Explosion, had a massive church, great office in D.C. that fought politically for conservative ideas. And he's just into ministry and he was visiting in a home with a couple and then there was with him an older gentleman who is experienced in sharing the gospel. He's just really good. Kennedy, not so much. So Dr. Kennedy starts explaining the gospel to this dear man and he believes it's going well and he asks, would you like to receive Christ? And the guy's like, "Ah, I don't think so. And Kennedy said in his own mind, well, clearly this man is non-elect. His friend took over explained through the gospel, and the guy prayed to receive Christ. And Kennedy's theology was just getting messed up in front of him, and he said, you imagine how I felt? I saw the non-elect become elect right in front of me, and here's the funny line. He said, I about fell out of my tulip tree. That's why evangelism explosion was used in vast arenas all over from in denominations. Calvinism isn't just in the Reformed theology. All Reformed theologians are Calvinistic, but not all Calvinistics are uh, Reformed. I don't want to be either. I, I want to be both literally was up in Cottonwood. I still remember I was pulling into somebody's house in Sedona and I got a phone call from a guy who um, was a pastor in town. I've never talked to him before. And he called me and I I still can't believe he said this. He said, hey, uh, Rob. I went, "Uh, yeah. He goes, this is Jim. Hey, Jim, how you doing? Good. He, He said, hey, I just heard a terrible thing about you. And I'm like, okay, this isn't good. And I didn't start guessing. It's like when a policeman pulls you over and he says, what did you do wrong? Don't say anything. (laughs) Yeah, you knew I don't have a license. And he goes, no, I didn't know that. Oh, it's the, you know, I don't have insurance. He goes, no, but please keep guessing. (laughs) So I didn't guess. He said, I heard a terrible thing about you. And I said, oh, which, I mean, what? He said, I heard you're a grace man. And I went, oh, tell me that rumor's not out there. And I said, what do you mean by that? He goes, oh, you know what I mean. Not really. Because, true story, a month ago, I was accused of being a Calvinist. Now, that's a guy who really knows what he believes. And I said, Jim, because it depends on what text I'm in. I'm letting it rest. And then just to be rude, I know, seriously, hard to, no, I was rude. No, please, just trust me on this. Yes, 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 yes. I know, he's like, my hero was rude. So he was a graduate of Master's College, And I said, let me tell you the problem with you MacArthurites. And then he says, he goes, what does that mean? And I went, okay, now we're lying. Please tell me there's not a chance that's the first time you've heard that. Out of any time I've been at this church for years that you choose to call me is when you think that my theology didn't match with yours. Where have you been? We're seeing people come to know Christ. It's driving. It's driving the conversation. And the health historically of Palmcroft is not being in the middle because that sounds like we can't make a decision. 
Historically, Palmcroft, and I'm, we'll go all the way back to its founding, and the great men and women and the leadership of this church have chosen not to find a balance between the two. They have chosen to embrace the two. And you take all the points under each of them, and you go, well, you can't believe that and this. And I go, no, you're exactly right. I can't. But I do. I know that I'm born in sin. And I know that Jesus Christ died as a sacrifice for all who believe. Elect, non-elect is actually none of my business. We're going to let him choose that because my job is not to lead people to Christ. My job, your job, is to tell people about Christ. And then we let him sort it out. And when you're balanced in the sense of you know you need to back off and you need to leave two ideas rest, even though you're mostly on one side. D. James Kennedy. One of the greatest evangelistic programs the world has ever seen. Out of a five-point Calvinist? Yes, out of a healthy five-point Calvinist. A hyper or a too far would never be that way. If somebody is without Jesus, it's not because they're not elect. It's because they rejected Jesus. I have, I have several titles, and uh, I have a favorite. When I earned my PhD, my wife got me a white lab coat that said Dr. Williams on it. I, my notepads on my desk are prescription pads. <laughs> and so, like, uh, pray thrice daily, you know, those kind of prescriptions. So it's doctor. Many of you know I don't use that because it's not my preferred Right here in H5, I'll never forget walking in about 94, walking from my office all the way over. My office is where the current library is today. Um, I, we were walking out there, and I am, I am in the zone because I'm going out to defend my ordination. And I'll be, I said some dumb things in that particular uh, ordination, but they were kind anyway, and I walked out as a reverend. Only people that I require to call me that is my own family. <laughs> uh, and then when they really push me and say, we'd rather not call you reverend, and I said, that's actually fine. You may call me master or lord. Uh, honestly, it makes no difference, and I like to give the family options. Then there's the title of pastor, shepherd. Many of you ask, since I've been here, which do you prefer being called? Well, I've got my given name as well. It's Rob, but not my favorite. It's like we misspelled it. I've stared at my birth certificate wondering, why was it R-O-B-B? Did the B get stuck and it hit twice? And I'll tell people, I'll say, my name is Rob, and they're spelling. I said, that's two Bs. And they went, okay. I said, it's B-R-O-B. And they're like, I said, I'm just kidding. And there are two Bs at the end. And they're like, is there a difference? And I went, no, there really isn't. Put the second one wherever you want it. They've asked, what do you prefer? Well, my preferred is pastor. So many of you asked from my first day back, what, what do I, on this campus, at this place, this ministry, I'm pastor. I'm telling you this because I'm going to speak to you as pastor right now. Speaking to you as pastor, as shepherd. This is so critical that you know for certain that you have responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ with belief in him. 
And then it's a relationship with him. It's salvation. It's eternal life right there. What about all my sin? Do I need to confess all of my sin? No, if you had the ability to confess all of your sin, if you had the ability to turn from all of your sin, you don't need Christ. You come exactly the way you are. You say, I'm a bit of a mess. Well, there's a lot of people around you that will agree with that. Yeah, you really are kind of a mess. And whoever says it, they are too. You don't turn from it all and confess it all. You can't. We go to him as we are, and I'm just begging you as your pastor that you know for certain that you have turned in belief to our Lord Jesus Christ, and you've trusted him alone for eternal life. That's it. That's, this is it. Somebody this last week says, I, the church is kind of lacking a purpose. And I'm thinking, I don't even know how that could possibly be true. If you're talking about specifics of where we're driving to and what nonprofits, yeah, I suppose we don't know, but it is absolutely clear that we are called to the gospel of Jesus Christ and therefore we will rate our success and our failure as a church on the number of people we get an opportunity to tell about Christ. No confusion. Jesus Christ died for you. You are given an opportunity to respond by faith. And therefore, have a relationship with God in the same way that Jesus has a relationship with God. And that's a big old fat period at the end of that sentence. Have you responded? Have you received Jesus Christ? Because as many as received him, the Bible says, they're children of God. Second, as your pastor, we have got to tell more people about Christ. I know it's hard. I know it's awkward, and you're looking for a segue. Hey, did you watch basketball this weekend? Yeah, I did. Do you know Jesus? And you're like, okay, okay, a hair awkward. Just maybe. There's got to be a better segue than that. But let's not err on the side of, well, since I don't know how to get from basketball to Jesus, I'm not going to do it. Yeah, I know. It's difficult. It's clumsy. They may not be happy about it. Or if you can't, bring them in here. I'll do it. But we have to be driven by our purpose of telling as many people as we can about Jesus Christ, and when we lead them to Christ, that we disciple them to the point where they can lead others to Christ. Am I right? Is this not us? I don't know of a youth group. I do not know of a junior high or high school ministry. I absolutely don't, where they're being taught how to handle the gospel how to explain it to somebody, and how to lead them to Christ, like what we have right here at Palmcroft. And whether you're high school or college, and whether you go through SMI or not, I don't care. We have kids go through the missionary program of high school and not even go on the trip. That's okay, because we're learning how to rightly handle the gospel of Christ. It's critical for us. So that's where it is. Do you know for certain? And secondly, are you telling others? Pray with me. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, it's so beautiful. You need that confidence today. Pray just right now to God. Heavenly Father, I do. I need you. I need you. Thank you for Jesus Christ his death for me, his resurrection for me. I believe in him. I trust him. 
for salvation. You weren't sure before. I want to tell you, you can feel sure now. And this is your big first chance to express it. No one's looking. Just raise your hand and say, I prayed along with you. I didn't have confidence, and now I do. Let me see your hand. Just lift it up right where you are. Up and right back down again. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. And right back down again. God bless the two of you over here. And for the rest of us. Heavenly Father, for all of us now, help us to be bold and confident telling others about Jesus. Amen.